All right. So uh, I want to welcome everybody back to New Year, number one, and to the uh, the CTSI seminar series for 2023. Um, today, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Jim Heath talk um, today from the Institute for Systems Biology. Just some programming notes. This is not only a CTSI seminar, this is the I3T co-sponsored. Um, it's the first seminar of the year, but just so everybody knows, we have several I3T seminars coming up. A couple of, of pretty big transplant people are coming up in the next few weeks. So we have Maria Luisa Alegre from the University of Chicago, and then our own Nicole Valenzuela from in the Department of Pathology, who's coming in uh, speaking on the 24th. So I probably don't have to do a lot of introduction today for Dr. Heath, but uh, I think it was worthwhile because even Tony sent me a few of these notes the other day about um, about his his history. Some number one, he did his PhD at Rice University. He was actually the principal grad student, the first author on this publication that's been cited over twenty thousand times, and actually gave the Nobel Prize to his uh, to his mentors there. It was mostly on this buckyball chemistry that mainly didn't turn out to be um, that as interesting as just the ability to, to work on. I, I think the point is, is that it was amazing and it opened up the field for uh, nanotechnology, but I think buckyballs themselves didn't, didn't pan out. Uh, I don't think that came out quite right, Jim. <laughs> I, oh boy. All right, it opened up the field of nanotechnology. Let's go with that first. After his PhD work, he moved over to UC Berkeley as a Miller Fellow, he, and he joined the research staff at uh, IBM Watson. I think he argues this is why he uses the uh, PC from now on. Um, and then he started in 94 down here at UCLA in, in molecular um, and pharmacology when Jim- uh, Chemistry. I was in chemistry department. You weren't in pharmacology? No. Shit, I'm doing really well here. <laughs> you may give it. I, I lived it. I can, I can give it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He moved over to Caltech, and then he went up to sister, uh, you know, the systems biology up in Seattle. Um, I think the, the key is Jim's an amazing colleague. Many of us know and worked with him. He he speaks a different language, I think, to a lot of us. He talks about free energy, he talks about you know, where reactions are gonna go, which for people like me who are immunologists have a really tough time trying to understand, apply immunology principles to Jim when he's talking about where a, you know, delta free energy is gonna go. But I will argue that my chemistry knowledge is crap, but I've learned a lot from all of our interactions with him. And, and he's always the smartest one in the room on, this, on these principles. And he talks about you know, these ideas that are not in textbooks, but they're, they're real. Um, he's received numerous awards, too many to talk here, but his ingenuity has led to creation of you know, a numerous number of companies, Pac Pharma, CTI, Molecular Imaging, Sophie Bio, Biosciences, Isoplexus, he was named a Forbes list of the top seven innovators um, in the world, the Scientific American top 50. Um, you know, we'll hear more about this technology today. Um, but for the trainees, I think this is, he's a true, you know, basic scientist who's working at the, at the intersection between clinical medicine and basic science. He's developing new technologies that go into patients. You know, it's, it's something that, Anybody like me, just a PhD who aspires to be involved in clinical work, you know, he's a model for what has gone on. So today he's going to talk about um, technologies for pairing uh, T cell receptor alpha beta genes with antigen specificities and with single cell transcriptomal phenotyping across patient populations. And I've done a crappy job here, but please welcome. <laughs> Yeah, I need to, um, so what, can we, sure. what happened to my, uh, oh, here it is, okay. Um, 
there we are. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like I needed to pin buckyballs while I'm up here, but I wasn't prepared to talk about those today. Um, first, I want to thank um, Rob and I thank Begonia for um, inviting me out here. Um, you know, I spent 10 years as a faculty member here. I was actually the one of the key guys to found the CNSI here. And um, that was such a charming experience that I went to Caltech. But I maintained friendships and collaborations at UCLA from the time I started here back in 93 until now. In fact, I just got a, a U54 Cancer Center grant with folks here. And a lot of the Parker projects we work on are with folks here. And so in many ways, this is like home. And it's wonderful to come back and see as many friendly faces and collaborators and colleagues. And so thank you. Um, um, so today I'm going to talk about a project um, that is, in, we've done a lot of technology development in my lab over the years. And, and I'm going to talk about a, a pathway of technology development and, and where it's gone. Um, but you know, when one thing that we did a lot of at Caltech was to develop a lot of single cell technologies that, and then commercialize them that are used in, in various places now. But, you know, a lot of these technologies, in fact, over the past five years, you know, the heterogeneity biology was like the confounding thing in biology for so long. It's gone. And those technologies that allow you to do that are now commodities. Doesn't mean they're cheap, but they're commodities. And I think it, you know, it's really changed how we think about doing biology, how we think about doing discovery. It's, you know, you can collect these massive data sets and then you got to be careful for what you ask for because now you've got a massive data set and trying to wind your way through that massive data set now is almost, I would argue that that's really the frontier of the, of the field now. Um, and, um, and it requires the same type of biological knowledge that people have had in the past, but I think it also requires new types of knowledge. And it also opens up, it's like having a new pair of glasses in many ways. Um, the one area in which I think there is still reason for technology development is not necessarily in doing some sort of omics from single cells, but in doing lots and lots of omics simultaneously from the same single cell. And I, I do think that that's an area where you know, it was one of the frontiers where you can actually really learn new biology. I think there's still a lot of value there. And I'll talk about that uh, today as we, um, uh, as, as um, uh, in, in a story. Um, and so this was a, um, uh, a lot of the work I've talked about, uh, I'll talk about today. We've had a number of, of uh, great collaborators, especially over the past few years. Tony's been our collaborator for I think Tony's first grant was, it was 50, yeah, we were, yeah we were 15 years ago. You were just starting. Um, and, and so, and then, and then um, you know, I've got a bunch of excellent graduate students that, um, in particular, the ones that have contributed here. And then uh, Daniel, who's uh, actually an undergraduate, has been um, spectacular. I've never had a, an undergraduate. He's, he's like first author on two cell papers. That's beyond my experience to have an undergraduate that can have that that type of impact. But that's that's what that's who he is. Okay, um, disclosures. All right. So I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, I presented. A, uh, I was at a talk with a guy named Adel Butte. I don't know if you know him. He runs this big data science um, biomedicine uh, thing up in San Francisco, and he talked before me, and he put up his disclosures. And it was like in four point font, completely packed. And I've always been kind of proud of my disclosure, but I was like embarrassed <laughs> after that. Anyway, so, so on to the science. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, this, this technologies for pairing uh, T cell receptors with antigens, with MHC, and with all the inf information you wanna know about the T cell receptor and doing it on large scale across many patients at the same time. And it's gonna take us a little while to get there, 
Um, and because this involved a number of technologies that um, some of which we've developed, some of which we've been borrowing from other folks, some of which we collaborated on. Um, but, you know, a lot of this was driven by, um, uh, you know, work that um, I think we started with, with Tony and, and Owen was involved in this many years ago to try to identify and even turn into therapies T-cells against, you know, whatever you want, whether it's, you know, a neoantigen or what have you. Um, and I would say that, that the technology I'll talk about today are, are mature, even though they're brand new, they're mature for class one MHC. For class two MHC, um, they're almost mature. And we haven't published anything, but we're almost there. And I'll show you some data. Um, and a lot of this is driven by, um, you know, by, by, by really wanting to, the, the peptide fragment that represents a virus or a tumor neo, uh, mutated antigen or, or something like that, um, and, and, and that's presented in the cleft of an MHC molecule to just look at this whole molecule together. And that was really the strategy that we sort of embarked on, I would say about eight years ago, was to try to develop a method that did this and reasonably high throughput. Um, and, and, and as we were developing this, you know, it became apparent. Uh, and if you think about like, a, like Tetramer, those of you who work with Tetramers, you're generally working with one or two or three Tetramers at a time. And if you make a library, it's gonna be a modest sized library of like 10 or 15 or so. Um, and, 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 and that's not the scale that's needed for, I think really understanding the biology that one cares about. If you look at at at, at um, a tumor that's you know even with a, a reasonable number of mutations and all six major HLA alleles, uh, for class one you're going to have at least a thousand putative antigens from a prediction algorithm and probably many more that may not come up in that prediction algorithm because they're not so those prediction algorithms are somewhat lacking. And then you've got for class two, it's almost surely a much higher number and it's it's almost completely unexplored. Um, and then, the, of course, the, the core technology behind detecting um, T cells for many years has been this. This is the peptide MHC um, uh, tetramer. It's on the strip tab in the scaffold that overcomes a relatively low avidity of a TCR and peptide MHC by giving you a multimer and sort of you get some sort of a, 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 a binding affinity increase from just local high concentrations. Okay, so one of the first things we did back, um, we published this maybe four years ago, is to, um, uh, instead of just using a tetramer scaffold to actually mount the tef tetramers on a nanoparticle scaffold that also allowed us to put DNA barcodes on it, but also allowed us to present on the order of 20,000 of these tetramers on a single nanoparticle. And, um, and that gives you, it turns out quantitatively higher affinity. I think dextromers and tetramers, for those of you who are familiar with that lingo, one's a sort of a polymer scaffold, one's a the streptavidin scaffold, they're right, roughly the same. You could argue that one's better than the other, but they're not that different. Um, but this is actually quantitatively different. Uh, and then when you, uh, but it has challenges. So uh, you see a specific hit, that's a live cell, and it's got this donut type structure because it's got one color of this of these uh, of these nanoparticles that are fluorescent labeled sticking around the surface of the cell, and a background cell is is pretty vacant. Okay, um, the challenge is that these actually make the cells unsortable by flow cytometry, and so we were developing these various little tools to try to capture the cells and then pull them out. And it's a, it's a very, very challenging proposition to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll show you where, we, where we've gone in a minute. Um, but then we, we also wanted to use this tool to look for lots and lots of antigens. And at, at the time that we started this project, this method from Tone Shoemaker was really the best thing out there. And that's where you load up for certain HLA alleles, you can load up a conditional antigen, you shine light on that, UV light, it releases that conditional antigen. If you do it in the presence of an antigen you want to switch in, it'll just replace. And so you can make a little library of about, um, you can make a reasonable sized library, but the reagents aren't stable. So you have to use them very, very quickly. Um, and so with that approach, and this is how we got around the, um, the, um, 
the 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 flow cytometry issue, and 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 this is this is actually a very recent version of this technology. Um, but um, well, let me show you what you're looking at here. So. If you see something big and dark, that's a, a cell that's been labeled with these nanoparticles. And then all the sort of what look like dirt, that's just free nanoparticles, many, many, many of those. And, and this guy here is a filter designed to spatially separate those two um, from each other by, by just simply mass effects. And you can, you'll see in a minute, so see there's all these little black dots coming along the bottom. Those are the sorted cells and all the free nanoparticles are up on top. And then these sorted cells flow down this uh, little windy thing here and, um, and, and go into a, a 10X thing. So you can now take a library of these things and, um, and, 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 and just take un, un, unexpanded human PBMCs, just get lots of TCRs paired with antigen if you've got the barcode for it, et cetera, okay? And, and so this is, um, and and it, it's it's obviously um, I got to get out of this. This I'm in a do loop. Okay, so when we when we tried this uh, the this technology the first time, and we did this on on patients from one of Tony's studies, um, and this like I said, this is published a few years back. Um, we found that uh, when we looked at neoantigen specific T cell populations in patients over time, that those populations tended to track. Um, the, the the tumor volume in pretty pretty straightforward fashion, and um, and at the time it was actually pretty challenging, but we were able to pull out some of these um, cells and and get TCR sequences and show at least for the ones that we pulled out that the TCR sequences did in fact recognize the antigen and were in fact good TCRs. Okay, um, this was a project that was um, I would say um, it scaled to allow us to do that experiment, but it was very challenging to take it to the next level. Um, and, and since those last four years now, um, there's um, lots of things have happened. Um, so single cell TCR sequencing now, which actually was hard four years ago, it's actually very straightforward now. Um, cloning and testing TCR clonotypes now, you know, in my, my lab we routinely do a hundred of those at a time. And that was something that almost no one ever did. Um, uh, engineering neoantigens have been clinically translated for cell-based cancer immunotherapies. That has driven a lot of the technology development. And then um, a new tech now is enabling more comprehensive surveys. And so, um, so this is a paper that um, came out of PACT, um, which was a company that Tony and I and David Baltimore started um, a, a few years back. And this was a nature paper um, that came out just last December. Um, in which PACT took some of these technologies and they modified them in ways that uh, to industrialize the process and adapted them, but they actually turned it into a, a clinical um, technology for treating patients. Um, and I would say there was some um, one key tech that PACT developed that enabled this, and I'll talk about two techs, but one tech was the um, idea of getting rid of the virus in terms of gene editing to knock in new, new genes. And so instead of having retroviral transfection of the T cells to knock out the TCR alpha beta chain that's endogenous to a T cell and to knock in at the beta chain locus exactly the T cell receptor that you want against the particular neoantigen that you're treating in those patients. Um, and then the, the other tech that, um, that enabled translation, um, and, and you can see it here, was, a, a, and I'll, I'll walk through what the tech was, but enabled now much larger libraries of, of antigens to be surveyed from patient blood. Um, and so this is data that was um, also in that paper. And, um, and here you're looking at these different neoantigen specific populations. Um, and this X is a 10 cells, the square is one cell, different colors are different clonotypes. And then if it's all in a box, these are different clonotypes against that particular neoantigen and so on and so forth. Okay, so, and then these T cells do travel to tumor, which is um, a very encouraging thing. And there were not a lot of toxicities. In fact, there were, there were what this, the therapy was well tolerated in this, in this phase one study. 
Um, and this was work that um, uh, my two postdocs did in collaboration with PACT. Okay, so a key tech that enabled that search, and I think is really now gonna transform how we think about both class one and class two TCRs and antigens, um, is circumvented the, the issue of these conditional libraries, the Shoemaker technology, um, by making something that's much more robust and scalable and automatable. And, um, and this was, the initial idea for this came out of David Baltimore's lab. Um, and we and PACT sort of independently pushed and developed this. Um, in my lab, uh, uh, William Chower, who's a MD PhD student, who's just now finishing up the PhD part of that, uh, MD part of that, and, and a few other folks in my lab uh, developed this. And so the idea is that you take this MHC peptide and you build it all as a single molecule. And so this has been around a long time. Um, I think the very first papers on this came out 20 years ago or so. Um, what we did is just to turn it into a really high throughput library format. And so you can take a plasmid that basically encodes everything here except for the antigen, and then just by something like Gibson assembly, just build out a thousand element antigen library for, for these SCTs. And, and then the, you can build them with a his tag or with a, a place for, for, for building uh, multimers, et cetera. Um, and then we did a lot of engineering to try to make sure that these things behaved well. We would, we would put lots of antigens in them in one direction and then different mutations in a different direction. Um, and you could easily make these, you know, uh, get to where you had for a given HLA allele, the right set of mutations to make it look like it behaved like the natural MHC allele. They're not always the same from allele to allele. Um, and that's what, that's what William did. And so then you end up with, this is a, just one of these plasmid libraries. And, and, this, and this ability to make these things in the scale fundamentally changes how you, how you go looking for, for um, um, T cells of interest. So this is a case of looking for T cells against um, uh, P53 um, neoantigens. And, and for those of you who know, this is what would be called a shared neoantigen, but barely shared, because this, this mutational spectrum is just, is just a nightmare here. Um, but some of the mutations do account for maybe the one and a half or 2%. Um, it turns out that the no, predictions for these mutations are notoriously bad. I don't know why, it may be because they just haven't got enough database to put them into some machine learning program. And so the approach we took was to take for patients who we knew had some of these mutations to just make all possible um, a nine and 10 and 11 more um, neoantigens and go looking. And you can do that because this technology is cheap. It basically makes the search cheap to do that. Um, and so, so we, in fact, we've done that, and 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 you do, in fact, begin finding these are all validated. You clone them, you test them; they all they all work. You begin finding that you can do this kind of thing in a pretty routine fashion. Okay, and then we've also been doing the same thing for class two, and here I just I'm just showing some data from my student Meng Yu Zhang just to show that this technology is coming. And when you see this little box that's up high holding a flow plot, that means that we've cloned the, the, the TCR, we've tested against the antigen, and it works. If it's down low, it doesn't. And so you get a yield here of about, about half of them that we identify in this process here are legitimate TCRs against the antigen presented in the natural format. That's pretty good for class two. Um, and for class one, it's about 75%. Okay. So, um, so then this is work that this young genius in the audience, Christine, did with PACT. Um, and I put this up because I wanted to show an interesting phenomenon, not just to advertise this young genius in the audience, Christine, um, but to point out that in this kinetic study of neoantigen T cells in a patient responding to checkpoint, there's some pretty interesting things that happen. And something that's interesting that happens is that you have different clonotypes that disappear or emerge over time. 
And so if you are trying to, and that's something that is just simply not considered when you're, when you're predicting what TCRs you're gonna use for therapy, okay? And why they're disappearing or emerging over time is also not something that is deeply understood. Some things about it are understood, but not deeply understood, okay? Um, and, so, and when you are detecting T cells for therapy, um, first you want to know, are T cells directed against truncal neoantigens or truncal antigens or whatever it is, it's, it's something essential to the cell and to the disease that's not going to be present in the healthy tissue. And, um, and that's something that the tech that we've already walked through allows you to know. Um, you want to know something about the TCR inter uh, antigen interaction strength. That's not binding affinity necessarily. It's just what is the nature of that overall interaction? That's something that has to be tested on a one-by-one on -one basis. Um, but I think it's becoming increasingly possible to do this computationally. And I think that that will be another thing that will step in and make this kind of information become commodity soon as well. But not yet. Um, you want evidence of clonal expansion, it seems. Um, uh, and, and you want to anticipate loss of heterozygosity by choosing your T cell receptors, perhaps to represent alleles from your mother and your father or something like that, okay? Um, uh, and, but then you also have these, these TCRs that initially recognize a tumor are often transient. Um, this is did absolutely true in viral antigens. It was reported by Tone Shoemaker several years ago, and we also reported it in, in a paper last year. And you know, I think there's just a lot we don't know about the details of these TCRs that are collected for, for therapy. And so, so we did an experiment, mostly we did it because we had a huge COVID study that we had um, a, a, a biobank. And so we had haplotype matched patients with we had time series data and allowed us to basically answer the question, what is it that anticipates the cell will disappear over time and what will cells will expand over time, okay? And so to do this, we took the entire SARS-CoV-2 proteome and we turned it into a, um, a, 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 a antigen library, a, a library of these single chain trimers to present um, those epitopes. And so what you're looking at here, more, more or less of where the antigens are. Um, so we tested, um, this is the, 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 the numbers of SCTs. These are the actual ones that we saw responses against. So you see responses across the whole viral proteome. We also tested for a different HLA allele at the same time. And we tested by you know, clever timing of how you did the experiments. We also looked for, for other antigens from other viruses. And, um, and, and, and the reason why we looked for these has to do with um, something called bystander activation. So in many immunological events, where you have antigen-driven immunological responses in the T-cell compartment, you also get non-antigen-driven inflammatory responses in the T-cell compartment, okay? It's called bystander activation. It's very common. You see it in, um, during HIV, you'll see CMV and EBV and influenza-specific T-cells will get activated. Um, during EBV um, infection, you'll get CMV-specific, hepatitis B and C, CMV and EBV, uh, COVID-19, we reported on CMV, CD8, so bystander activated. This bystander activation, if you look at these cells, and I don't have the, I, I can show you that I don't have it on my, on my slide, there's really no evidence of antigen experience. But they get activated through, um, through basically cytokine signaling. Um, it's not always well understood. Um, but when they are activated, they're pretty cytotoxic. They crank out interferon gamma, they crank out granzyme B, they're pretty aggressive. These are all viruses, but for bacteria activation, there's a whole, a whole review paper, it happens here too. I kind of suspect it probably happens during cancer, but you know, not necessarily something someone has looked at, but I think it's probably just a broad characteristic of, of, of immunological um, activation is gonna have these bystander activations. And in fact, we see there's, there's some clinical consequences. When we look at CMV bystander activation in, in COVID, um, even out to, to over time, you find that certain of these populations are actually emerging over time in patients that have uh, gastrointestinal long-term COVID symptoms. 
And so there does seem to be some clinical consequences of, or at least associations with this type of bystander activation. And they've been reported in other programs as well. Okay. So in a general sense, when you think about uh, in terms of cells that expand and contract, you have a pool of naive or memory T cells, uh, antigenic simulation, they expand into effectors and they can contract back into a memory pool. And, um, and for bystander activation, generally these are gonna be just a memory pool. Um, they're gonna, no antigen stimulation, but they will expand and then they'll contract um, and, and reform a memory pool. Okay, so we took these 65 COVID patients um, that were all A2.1 uh, and some of them were A24.2 and about half of them were CMB positive. Um, and we took a 650 element SCT library we pulled it into 10 batches and, um, and we would pull down now from all these patients, T cells specific to each of these 10 batches, keep them on ice. And then after we finished doing it for the whole library, which took about two hour time period, we just do 10 X, okay? And so what we're able to do then is, um, is generate this data is um, a large, UMAP, which is the, I think many people are familiar with, which you can see the different phenotypes of the T cells. But for every T cell, uh, the barcodes tell us what the antigen is. We get the T cell alpha beta chain from the sequencing, as well as the rest of the single cell RNA seq data. And then um, because we have the single cell RNA seq data, we actually can figure out what patient it was because the SNPs allow us to demultiplex it for the individual patients. And so it's a pretty novel look at biology because now we have 10,000 cells, each of which we know the antigen, each of which we know the T cell receptor and the peptide MHC. And, and I'll show you in a minute, we actually have the time series on this. Um, and when we, test, um, when we test these antigens for, and you know, test the T cells that we capture this way, um, they, about three quarters of them are pretty good killers you see variations in terms of how they'll respond when stimulated. And we ever use a T2 model, meaning you have an antigen presenting cell, you load it with the antigen in the natural format, you clone the TCR, and you just see what happens. Okay, um, so you see variations in terms of their functional activation, but nevertheless, the, they, they do work and, and they're, they're selective, okay? Um, here's what it looks like across um, patients. So this is a particular um, antigen. I think this is just from just one of the ones. I didn't just a randomly selected one. Um, different patients show up as different colors. Um, this is a CMB antigen. Uh, different patients show up as different colors. These two reg regions here were largely by uh, individual patients that were either a, as a cancer patient or an immunocompromised patient that really had outlier behaviors. But other than that, um, um, you, if you look at just the, the regions not in by these boxes, you can see that the SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells and the bystander activated CMB specific T cells are actually occupying very different parts of this, of this phenotype map. Um, and then here is showing um, across patients, um, you know, very weak T cell responses by and large were, were you know, more ill patients. Um, but there's no trend here, really. I mean, you could say that that's a trend and it matches literature, but as soon as you quit squinting and look, it's like everybody's different. It's actually really hard to say if you have a really weak T cell response or a really strong T cell response, you're gonna be in great shape. Okay, and if you look at now um, who had the virus, active, uh, bystander CMB activated cells, about you know, uh, two thirds of the patients or so were maybe half were CMB positive, and then some of the patients almost exclusively had, um, you know, had bystander activation to the, uh, to the um, uh, detriment of, of SARS-CoV-2 specific activation. And it's not obvious that they paid a big price for that. But, um, but there's, of course, there's a B cell compartment that we also know about and I'm not talking about here. Um, if you looked at the, 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 the overall responses we saw, there was one very dominant antigen, and this is a, um, uh, it's a whole story in and of itself because I think it's actually a, 
a, a set of clonotypes that are in fact very cross-reactive. And I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell that story because um, I, don't, I don't understand it yet. But but so but but anyway, there's there's this but there's a, a handful of clones here, but they also have reactivity against other antigens. But then basically you get you know pretty good responses across the entire um, the entire um, proteome. If you look at it on a domain level, and you can make lots and lots of ways to look at this data, but I think this is kind of illustrative. Um, so I picked out just three domains, a spike, ORF6, and CMV. Um, and here we're looking at just a, 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 the, these dominant, well-known literature CMV antigens. And what you find is that the phenotypic distributions of the T cells against these particular domains are really quite unique, okay? And in fact, and I, I can't prove this yet, but we have done this sort of machine learning approach to see if you know the alpha beta chain CDR3 regions, if you know the antigen, if you know the MAC, can you actually predict the phenotype of the T cell? And the answer is yes, I think you can. We need to do a lot of validation work to prove that, but it kind of looks like that's the case, okay? Okay, so let's talk about kinetics. Um, so we have, um, so, you know, what you normally think, uh, just to expand on my previous cartoon, is that you start off with these naive memory pools, they expand to form effectors. Over time, you're going to have some of these cells here will expand, maybe some that you don't even detect here will expand, and then some of them, a lot of them will contract, because overall, you're going to have less cells here than you had here. And... In our study, um, we actually have a massive database of, of uh, 200 and some patients comprises, but they include our 65 A201 patients. We had them at three time points. We have a TCR alpha beta genes for every one of these cells. We have a few hundred membrane proteins, and we have single cell RNAc. So we take our database I just talked about, we project it on here, and we still have 10,000 cells that we can follow over time against these different antigens. Okay, so when you look at this new UMAP of just those antigen-specific T cells over time, you find that it's actually a pretty simple UMAP. You get memory, you get what do we call memory-biased effector cells and effector cells, okay? Um, and if we look at SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells, and I just do a difference map, the expanding cells come from these memory biased effectors and the contracting cells come from these effectors. And if I look at CMV specific, the expanding ones come from the memory cells and the contracting ones come from the memory biased effectors, okay? That's pretty simple description, but we can do actually a little better than that. And, um, and so what I've plotted here now is, over the this three months of infection, cells that a clonotype. So each of these clonotypes is represented by at least 10 cells. So there's a lot of statistics here. Um, clonal cells that contract over time, meaning that there's less of them out at convalescence than there is um, at, um, at initial diagnosis, ones that expand over time, and ones that are what we call persistent, meaning that they don't really expand or contract. And so now we take the the, the protein and RNA data from these cells, and we ask, can we predict at initial diagnosis which cells will expand and which cells will contract? And of course, with enough data, you can make any kind of a classifier. So it's not shocking that you can actually do this prediction, but what comes out of this prediction is pretty interesting. So here's for SARS-CoV-2, these are the cells that contract, these are the cells that expand, and by and large, you would expect the highly cytotoxic cells to contract, and you expect memory phenotypes to expand. You kind of see that, but you also see a lot of what are called NK cell markers. Um, and those include um, uh, KIR um, proteins. Um, they include um, uh, this NKP30, and, and, and there's another NKP somewhere here that are um, a cytotoxic markers for NK cells. Um, if I look at CMV, it's basically very similar. The orders are changed a little bit, um, but, but I still have a mixture of NK cell markers, now actually more important, uh, memory markers, 
and exhaustion markers also uh, are in those cells that 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 expand out, and and, and the ones that contract are largely um, uh, uh, cytotoxic markers. So these NK cell markers are new. That's something that we didn't expect to see. Um, and, 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 and normally, of course, one thinks about NK cell markers is associated with NK cells. These aren't, these are associated with T cells. Um, there's, if you know of people that are T versed in T cell literature and, and NK cell literature know that these two lineages are closely related to each other, that you do see NK cell markers on T cells sometimes and vice versa. Um, but in fact, just recently, and this is work that was, you know, led by Mark Davis, um, it's been shown that um, this Kier, which is, in fact, he's talking about um, this, this, these Kiers right here, that these Kiers are actually involved in, um, in, in suppressing uh, certain uh, populations of T cells in autoimmune diseases and COVID-19. Um, one way that they do that is that they do that through, um, this is the uh, MHC molecule, there's the antigen, this is the TCR binding regime, but here is the regime where some NK, in, in some of these Q receptors will bind depending on what the HLA epitope is, what the what your HLA allele is. And in fact, there's what's called the BW4 epitope, which looks like this, which you actually see a lot of it in, in HLA-C types, but there's other types of these epitopes. And if you look through the literature, you'll find these are the most famous ones, but there's other ones. And these provide an opportunity for these, for these uh, uh, NK cell receptors to bind to, to, uh, to, to MHC, sometimes in an antigen-dependent manner. It's not a binary score. And it has to do with the fact that not all of these HLA alleles present these epitopes in exactly the same way, and, the, and, and et cetera. There's other issues like that. But there's been work to develop this, an analog score, and you can develop it for either the BW4 epitopes or for the cures that bind to those, to those epitopes. And so, you know, I'm going to finish with a, in a, on this end of the pretty incomplete story. But if you take those scores, and that's the only thing you take, you can actually predict what cells will expand, what cells will contract, and what cells will persist. And I don't actually know why that is, okay? I don't understand that yet. But here's the early clonotypes that expand, and this is the Cure2DL3 score, Cure2DL1 uh, uh, score. Here's the ones that are persistent, and you see they basically sit on both sides of these quadrants. And here's the ones that contract and they sit down here. And I believe what's happening, because in turn, it turns out, well, I believe what's happening is this is some sort of suppression mechanism to damp down the immune response that these cures are playing, in fact, a very important role in. I don't know what that mechanism is. In fact, I've, I didn't even know what a cure receptor was until a, a few months ago. So I've been on a very steep learning curve trying to understand this, but they have a very, very important role to play in how these T cells evolve over time. And, I, and, and, and you can use them to predict what those T cells are gonna do over time. And I think that that's actually a big deal. Um, and so let me just give some tentative conclusions. Um, so tools for pairing antigens with CD8 and soon CD4 T cell clonotypes have advanced rapidly to the extent now that if you wanna search for a thousand different T cell populations, do it. And you can integrate that search with other an analyses and do a multi-omic type of analysis. So you're stuck in the world of having too much data, which is the sort of thing we talked about at the beginning. You know, be careful what you ask for. Um, the tools that enable quantitation of T clonotypes against thousands of antigens in a single experiment are now available. They're not, you can't buy it. But you know, something that Tony and I were talking about earlier today, and maybe there's a, like a resource that could be set up for this kind of thing. And I think that would be a really valuable thing to do. And well, I think we'll probably talk with the Parker folks about that. Uh, these tools may now be integrated with other omics. Um, and I'm almost certain this is gonna have an impact on how you think about selecting tools. 
uh, T cells for immunotherapy. Nature's response is to give you a balanced attack, cells that will persist, cells that contract, cells that expand, and there's a reason for that. And I, I don't think we understand that reason, but a long time ago when Hong Wu was here, and I was you know, egotistically talking about how physics always had the fundamental laws and biology was like whatever. And she said the biology, the law of biology is balance. And she was right. Okay, and so somewhere in here, there's a there's a balanced immune response that does seem to, to to characterize a healthy immune response against something bad. And I think understanding what that balanced immune response is is the kind of thing that I think these tools can begin resolving. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much. I'm always looking for postdocs, especially talented ones. If you're a talented postdoc, I'm looking for you. And, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, questions? Hi, Jim. Thank you so much for the nice presentation and for the extra. Um, I'm actually curious about this last set of data that you presented, where you see this correlation that they're here, can I put it ready? how the phenotype of the T cells are going to evolve. And this is definitely something that we are looking into. And we definitely don't have much data yet to show. Um, but I'm actually curious about the others. What, because you found many other um, factors that were actually overexpressed in, in like, depending on, on yeah. how the T cells uh, evolve over time. And so I'm curious about what happened with the other ones, especially because you described this NK like phenotype that has also been previously described in plant cell therapy with longer persistence. Um, so I wonder, have you looked at the potential predict predictive uh, role of these all these other factors? We have. In fact, um I was trying to um I've been spending a lot of time on that. Okay. So if I take so some of these patients simply don't have these BW4 epitopes, okay? And all patients' T cells will seem like they randomly will pop up these cure receptors on the surface, okay? Um, but if there's no BW4 epitope, the cure receptor has nothing to do, and it goes away, and you can't make any sense out of that data. If you do the BW4 epitopes, it actually falls all into place beautifully. It makes a lot of sense, okay? But it's been confounding in the literature for a long time because you need a lot of patients, both with BW and without, to actually resolve these differences, okay? So if we take patients with, and we can use this score here on these, and we can say, if you have these BW for epidemics, or if you don't, what does this look like, okay? And it's actually pretty different. So what you find is that for, uh, just for SARS-CoV-2, is that uh, this memory marker, KLRG1, are, are, uh, uh, absolutely stays here. Granzyme B stays here. But a lot of cytotoxic things like perforin pop up into the persistent cells, which is what makes me think that these cure-expressing cells that have a target have a job to do. I don't know what that job is, but they have a job to do, okay? And so the, anyway, this, even these plots, which look really lovely, are actually confounded by the heterogeneity of these MHC alleles for these types of NK molecules that pop up here, uh, epitopes for the type of NK molecules. And then that's gonna be very dependent on the HLA type. It is, but, but there's a lot of HLA types that most half patients have these, half patients don't to first order. Um, and there's probably things that we don't understand that are, you know, uh, other epitopes that are, are there as well. But, but it's like, yeah, that's right. Um, but the exhaustion markers tend to be in the, in the cells that are persisting. These exhaustion markers behave like you'd expect to. You can do like pseudo knockout experiments, but I look at like, no lag three, what happens to PD-1, stuff like that. It all behaves exactly as you'd expect it to. Um, but these, these, these NK markers really move around in very interesting ways. And very exciting talking, Barry, as you were. So um, 
it's so uh, exciting to see that those new technologies now allow quick, uh, quick cloning out of those uh, PISA receptors and binding out the matching MHC and the peptide. But those are mainly designed to study the conventional PISAs and the classical MHC molecules, right? So uh, besides that, there's a big area of the PISA called the innate PISAs and restricted by the unconventional MHC molecules. Uh, could you comment on if the existing technology or the new technology upcoming can be used to explore that uh, largely unknown area? As long as you had gold standards against which to compare results from engineered system against the gold standard system, absolutely. So, you know, the gold standards that we use when we develop our SET versions were we would capture T cells and viral and, and like influenza patients and look for just to like, you know, glyph analysis or something like that of the T cell receptors against known T cell receptor databases or CMV or something like that. And, and, and we, I think we published that or it's coming out or something like that. That actually works. That's actually the metric one uses to do this kind of thing. If you had a similar gold standard that you could, do, you would probably want to do this whole mutation library, or at least a subset of it to optimize the, 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 the design. But yeah, I think you probably could. Yeah. Yeah, Katie. So you talked about, and this is building upon Chris's question, you talked about the different, the, the heterogeneity in HLA types. Have you looked into the actual cure types? Because in terms of it, one of the more polymorphic versions of the genome are the, the, the cure types of the patient. And once again, you have a numbers issue in terms of uh, that becoming a very individual thing. But do you see any sort of motif convergence in the cure types? Well, we do see the, the cure types that uh, I, I can't remember. So you've got cure two and cure three, and the two and three correspond to numbers of transmembrane domains. You get cure three DL2, for example, that second two. So three transmembrane, cure three, three transmembrane, DL2 means two intracellular domains. And if it's DL1 or DL2, it's suppressive or excitatory. And then you've got cure two, same thing, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we've seen, at least in our patients, these two, uh, cure three, DL2, and L3, and cure three, DL1, seem to be by far the most common ones. And now this is protein data. If you actually look at the transcript data, you'll be very confused. Transcript data is very noisy. The protein data is much cleaner. And so we use the, in fact, this is why this curve is, looks like a lot better than that curve, because basically this has this, this has a lot of transcript mark. All the intracellular markers that we're using here, the top two predictors on either side is what we're using. These are all transcripts, and these are are mostly proteins. So that's site seek then. Yeah, but we've we've gone through and just done a like an antibody on these patients to make sure that they're and they they are. They're, and this is blood. Degrees. Yeah. It, do you think it varies between tumor and blood? Because I know in, in our hands, we see- It would vary a lot. So these cells here don't obviously have any tissue homing markers. Okay. And so it's not obvious that they are really that different in tissue or blood. But the, the SARS-CoV-2 ones do, and probably it's very, it's very different to tissue. So well, you have homing, but what about NK receptors? Oh, I, yeah, I don't know. Because, I mean, there's clearly these early activation NK markers that are uh, activating and, and inhibitory that you see within the tumor tissue, too. We see it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know how they would play. And in, in, I mean, in a viral infection may be very different from a tumor in, in that respect, yeah. but I don't know. Question here. Uh, it's actually a two-part question. I uh, first, kind of the relationship between the bystander effect and how that determines patient outcome. And um, and also how, if there's any relationship with your career peers and perhaps the bystander activation that 
could to predict maybe some of the outcomes that you're saying in terms of the balance? Is that part is that possibly part of the reason you're we have done a lot of work on looking at the impact of these cures and um and and the bystander cells on 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 outcome like long term like long covid chronic issues things like this um you resolve nothing until you account for these bw4 epitopes and then you actually resolve some things and so these once again these bw4 epitopes are are can be very absence or presence unless you account for it you won't resolve much and so it, it, it does seem to have an impact and we've seen it on um uh for example um and i don't think this is just a something you if you have a lot of data you discover things because every liver marker we see marking liver health is impacted by having those epitopes and having that expression at the long term so there is some issue there the cmv in terms of bystander activation its impact is not very high and you know we do see expanding cmv cells over time are associated with gi pask but so are expanding sars cov2 specific cells over time uh, cytotoxic are associated with gi pask um, but by and large from what i can tell there's a lot of literature where people have really searched and they and if you look at like three patients you always find something but if you look at 65 patients and you see a lot and you have a lot of you don't see there's no effect at all it's very very minimal for this bystander activation um i don't think that's always true but in this case it's it's it seems to be true There are a couple from the from the chat. I, I think um, one of them's can the antigens be degraded for better identification um, for more complex ones with better results? I don't know. Uh, not sure. I'm sure they can. And then um, they're talking more about questions about cures can you can these be detected and manipulated more i think there's obviously lots lots of there's them. a lot of antibodies against cures you can't always tell the difference between dl1 and dl2 because they're cytoplasmic domains and antibodies will obviously capture cure three or cure two or whatever um so there's well-known ways to to capture those cells they're, they're actually very well known and people yeah. have studied them for a long time in nk cells and allo reactivity and organ transplants and things like this their importance in controlling T cell biology is now more, is that something that's only becoming appreciated fairly recently? That I think is certainly the one of the more interesting things because you certainly see all sorts of interesting NK receptors, killer lectin receptors, killer inhibitory receptors right. on, on classical CD8 alpha beta T cells and certainly in early activation markers and tumors. I know we see them all the time and we puzzle all the time about what it means. Yeah, we have, we, we do, there's a lot of biology, I didn't go into it, but KLRD1, KLRD, CC1, C2, which are activating or suppressive, uh, but they're both on NKs and T cells, but they're mostly NKs, they're, the right. K is NK. Um, yeah, they, they, they have big impact here. Okay, if there aren't um, any other questions, I think we ought to call this and uh, he has to go to lunch, so thank you very much. <laughs>